Good afternoon, my name is Marie Rienzo, and I want to welcome you to the NIH Office of Disease Prevention's Mind the Gap webinar series. This series explores research design, measurement, intervention, data analysis, and other methods of interest to prevention science. Our goal is to engage the prevention research community in thought-provoking discussions to promote the use of the best available methods and to support the development of better methods. Before we begin, I have some housekeeping items. You can submit questions during the webinar by clicking on the question mark in the WebEx toolbar. Please direct your questions to all panelists. We will open the floor to questions that have been submitted via WebEx at the conclusion of today's talk. The slides and video recording will be posted on our website, prevention.nih.gov slash mindthegap in approximately one week. You'll receive an email when they are available. Lastly, we would appreciate your feedback about today's webinar. Upon closing the WebEx meeting, you'll be prompted to complete an evaluation. We would appreciate your feedback as it will help us improve this webinar series. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. David M. Murray, Associate Director for Prevention and Director of the Office of Disease Prevention. Evan Mayo Wilson, who is, a, who is an assistant scientist at the Department of Epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. His research centers on evaluations of health and social interventions, particularly methods for conducting, reporting, and synthesizing clinical trials. He is a core faculty member in the Center for Clinical Trials and Evidence Synthesis, the Center for Drug Safety and Effectiveness, and the Center of Excellence in Regulatory Science and Innovation. Dr. Mayo Wilson has contributed to multiple guidelines for reporting research, including the Consolidated Standards of Reporting Trials, Extension for, Con for Social and Psychological Interventions, and the American Psychological Association Journal Article of Reporting Standards. He is an author of National Institutes for Health and Care Excellence Guidelines for the Identification and Management of Social Anxiety Disorder, Bipolar Disorder, and Psychosis. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Mayo Wilson. Thank you very much for having me today. Um, I've been asked to talk about challenges associated with multiple outcome definitions in clinical research. Before I start, I want to acknowledge uh, some sources of funding here. Most of the work that I'm going to talk about today was supported by PCORI, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Um, and these are some of the other people who have contributed to this work. Uh, Kay Dickerson was the principal investigator on the MUD study, and as you can see, uh, and I think you'll understand as we get into today's talk, a, a whole lot of people contributed to it. So today what I want to talk about uh, is some of the history behind concerns about multiple outcome definitions and multiple analyses, which people commonly refer to as multiplicity. I want to talk specifically today about the evidence of multiplicity in clinical trials and some of the implications that that has for how we conduct and understand research. And then I want to touch on a few ways that we might address multiplicity in clinical research. So, People have been talking a lot, both in the scientific community and in the popular press recently, about a replication crisis, about the trouble that we've had lately reproducing the results of uh, clinical research and other types of health research. And you may be aware of some of the controversy that's come out of Cornell uh, that's been associated with some questionable research practices and what people see as salami slicing of data until uh, the researchers got statistically significant and publishable research uh, results. But these concerns have been uh, around not just in, in that case, but in the broader kind of psychological and, and scientific community. This is a slide from the uh, replication project, which was led by Brian Nosek and the Center for Open Science. And what they did here was they tried to reproduce the results of 100 psychological experiments. And what you can see in this figure are the uh, results from the original uh, studies on the uh, x-axis and the results from the replications on the y-axis. And you can see that most of the results fall uh, below this uh, diagonal line, which is to say that the effect sizes in the replication studies were smaller than the uh, effect sizes in the original studies. And on the top and the sides here, you can see the distribution of the uh, 
uh, p-values from the original and from the replication studies. So when they looked at the p-values in 100 uh, original studies, they found that most of the original effect sizes were um, statistically significant, which are the, the ones on top in blue. And you can see uh, uh, by comparison, the p-values in the replications were not statistically significant, which is shown by the, uh, the field in, uh, in red or, or salmon here. I think that this is probably happening because uh, there are a lot of effects that are actually estimated in these studies and that only a small number of them are being published. So Steve Goodman and colleagues wrote this piece in uh, uh, Science Translational Medicine a couple years ago now, where they identified a number of different features of research reproducibility. Um, and they talked about multiplicity as maybe the principal source of the non-reproducibility or falsity of claims in the published literature. So what they say here is that multiplicity combined with the incomplete reporting of research may be the single largest contributor to non-reproducibility. But this is an idea that's been around for a long time. Uh, Theodore Sterling wrote in 1959 that publication decisions might be influenced by uh, inferences drawn from tests of significance. Uh, and one thing that's interesting when we look back on that paper now is that in the first table, he considered uh, in four journals in psychology, the number of findings that were statistically significant, but he also considered the number of those findings that were drawn from replications of previously published experiments. So even in 1959, there was already this conversation beginning about not just publication bias based on statistical significance, but also the importance of reproducing research uh, and testing the same hypothesis again in a new study. There have been calls in the medical literature in particular to uh, try to address these problems of multiple hypothesis testing and the need for a uh, kind of central repository of information about clinical research in order to prevent reporting bias. And uh, in 1977, Tom Chalmers wrote this piece that was really calling for more uh, randomized experiments in general. But almost as an aside, at the uh, bottom of this piece, he says there ought to be at least some better method of centrally recording the sporadic individual trials now uh, going on. So he was identifying this need to uh, register these trials in some central way so that we could draw together the results of multiple studies. Uh, and this grows into what we see later on as a, uh, a register of, of clinical trials. Rob Rosenthal, a few years later, wrote a very famous piece about the file drawer problem. And here he kind of, as a thought experiment, says, what if the journals that we read are just full of type 1 errors, that the file drawers are filled with 95% of studies that show non-significant results? And I think that uh, most of us today believe that that's not the case, that we are somewhere between having all true positives in medical journals and, and other kinds of uh, scientific journals and having a lot of type 1 errors. But the, the question really is where on that continuum uh, we are at the moment. There were formal calls in the 1980s based on these sorts of concerns about publication bias for trial registers. So developing on this idea that uh, Tom Chalmers floated in the 70s, we should have some central way of registering clinical trials. And uh, of course, it was another 15 years before we had a mandate for clinical trial registration and, and a system for doing that by way of clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, not much later than that, people were talking not just about the selective publication of entire trials, but about the selective publication of results from individual trials. Uh, and in this piece in 1993, Mills says that uh, if you torture your data long enough, they'll tell you whatever you want to hear. So we, we get this idea that if we conduct many tests within an individual study, we can get a lot of different results. And that becomes a, a kind of central theme going forward. In the late 90s, Kerr writes a very famous piece on hypothesizing after the results are known or harking, and he outlines a lot of the concerns that we have today about reproducibility and about what people now refer to uh, very commonly as p-hacking. A really seminal piece in the history and the evolution of these uh, concerns about multiple hypothesis testing and multiple outcomes is this piece by Anwen Chen. Uh, 
he and, and colleagues showed that a cohort of studies followed through from inception to publication demonstrated a number of different kinds of reporting bias. So they showed not only that trials that had statistically significant outcomes were more likely to be published than trials that didn't have statistically significant outcome, outcomes. They also found that the outcomes from trials with significant results were more likely to be published than the uh, outcomes that had non-significant results. And they found that in about a third of the trials, a quarter or a third of the trials, there were changes in what people described as the primary outcomes. So uh, secondary outcomes were promoted to primary outcomes in publications, primary outcomes were demoted to secondary outcomes, and there were changes in the way that people described those outcomes. And you might think that given all of these concerns that we've had about the consequences of focusing on statistical significance, that we might be less and less focused on statistical significance over time. But in fact, the opposite is, uh, appears to be true. If we look at the results of randomized trials that are reported in uh, Medline over time, it looks like more and more of those abstracts report at least uh, one p-value. So uh, we're, we're getting more and more uh, focused on the statistical significance of results, despite these problems that we have with reporting and interpreting evidence based on uh, the results of null hypothesis testing. An additional layer of complexity in this is that there are a lot of different sources about the results of uh, clinical trials, as well as other types of studies, of course. So we know that in a published clinical trial, there might be short reports like letters and conference abstracts about that trial. There might be journal articles. There might be a trial registration on clinicaltrials.gov or another registry. Uh, and there might be information from regulators like FDA that becomes publicly available. But there are also a lot of un uh, unpublished or non-public data sources. So we might have unpublished manuscripts, we might have individual patient data, grant proposals, other types of study protocols and case report forms where people have actually jotted down the results for individual patients. Uh, and we might have memos and emails between investigators about the conduct of the study. And so you can get different results when you look at what's actually published and what's unpublished. And that's where a lot of the concerns about publication bias and selective outcome reporting have come from, are these comparisons of what's in the public domain versus what's in the uh, unpublished or, or non-public data sources. Swaro Padula and uh, colleagues here did a bit of work on uh, gabapentin, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2009, in which they compared what was in public data sources about trials of gabapentin for a variety of conditions versus what was in uh, non-public data sources. And in this figure, you can see in red the primary outcomes uh, in unpublished research, and in blue, the uh, primary outcomes in published uh, research. And we have here the results from uh, a number of different trials. So somewhat unsurprisingly, if we look at the right panel here, in the unpublished research, there were uh, results that were not statistically significant. But what's interesting uh, here is that for the uh, trials that were published in journal articles, we have a mix of primary outcomes that are uh, uh, not statistically significant in red, uh, but we also have p-values for primary outcomes in blue here that appear to be statistically significant, and sometimes they contradict the p-value for the, uh, the same trial, which is in a non-public data source. So how is this happening? Uh, in these trials, there were 21 primary outcomes in protocols for 12 published trials, uh, but only 11 of those are published with no changes. Uh, and in the publications, 12 new primary outcomes were introduced, leading to a total of 28 primary outcomes in publications, only 11 of which matched the primary outcomes that were in the non-public data sources. But of course, you can't just change the outcomes wholesale. You can't say that you're going to do a study in pain and then decide that it's really going to be a study about depression. So uh, we looked in, uh, in some more recent research at how people defined outcomes in multiple ways and the opportunities for changing the outcome definitions in the, the publications. So today, when you register a trial on clinicaltrials.gov, you have to use this framework that Deb Zarin and colleagues described here. Um, where you define what the domain is, the measurement, the metric, the method of aggregation, and the time point for each outcome. So you could measure anxiety in a lot of different ways. Uh, in this example, they've used the Hamilton Anxiety Rating Scale, but you could also use the BEC, or you could use a fear questionnaire. 
and you could use different metrics. You could uh, define the outcome as the value at the end of the trial or as the change from baseline, or you could define it as time to a, a certain event. And you could aggregate the results continuously or categorically. And if you did it continuously, you might have a mean or a median. And if you did it categorically, you might say it's the proportion of participants who decreased by 50% or the proportion of participants who decreased by eight points or more on, the, uh, on this measure. What you can see in this figure on the right is that if you start off with four outcome domains and you use two measures for each of those outcome domains, two metrics, two methods of aggregation, and two time points, you'll end up with a total of 64 outcomes. And so that seems like a whole lot of outcomes associated with just four outcome domains. And the problem here is that in many cases, we define outcomes at the level of domain. We say that our outcome is pain, but we don't provide uh, enough information about the measure, the metric, the method of aggregation, and the time point, both to reproduce the analysis that somebody's done in a study and also to prevent cherry picking after the results are known. Another layer on top of that is that there are multiple results for every outcome uh, that you define on clinicaltrials.gov. So if you have multiple analysis populations, which might be the people that started the trial, or it might be the people that completed some specified dose of the intervention or just took one dose of a drug, and then you have multiple ways of handling the missing data, you could use multiple imputation, or you could use uh, a mixed effect analysis, or you could use last observation carried forward. And if you use different transformations or covariates in your models, you're going to use, uh, you're going to end up with different numerical results for each of those outcomes. So we looked at how many different ways people actually defined the outcomes and analyzed their data in two case studies. We took all of the randomized trials that we could find for gabapentin for neuropathic pain and quetiapin for bipolar depression. Uh, we included studies where participants and investigators were masked. They were placebo-controlled parallel RCTs. Uh, and we conducted comprehensive searches for published and unpublished data. And we selected these cases because we knew that there was a lot of unpublished data for gabapentin that we ha had access to because Kay Dickerson had served in, as an expert witness uh, in patient litigation against Pfizer. Uh, and we knew that there were some unpublished uh, reports about quetiapin from bipolar depression. So here's what we found. We found 21 trials of gabapentin. We found seven trials of quetiapin. Most of them were conducted by the manufacturers. Uh, most of the trials had uh, about 150 or 500 uh, patients, depending on uh, which drug we're looking at. Uh, and most of the trials for gabapentin had only uh, public data sources, but we found uh, non-public data sources for six of them. For quetiapin, we found only public data sources for three trials, and we found non-public data sources for four. And I'm going to focus here just on the gabapentin case study, but the results are more or less the same for the uh, quetiapin case study. And here for gabapentin, we had 21 trials. Six of them had non-public data sources, and we pre-specified that we were going to look at four outcome domains. So there were some other outcome domains in some of these trials, but for the purpose of this kind of methodologic study, we just looked at four. So we looked at pain intensity, we looked at mood, we looked at sleep disturbance, and we looked at quality of life. And what we found was that uh, across all trials, there were a lot of different measures of pain intensity as well as the other outcome domains. But a uh, great deal of the multiplicity here was associated with the pain intensity domain. So people used the uh, brief pain inventory, they used clinical uh, global impression of change, they used uh, a Likert scale of 1 to 11, a Likert scale of 1 to 4, they used the short form McGill pain questionnaire. And then there were lots of totals and subtotals associated with each of those. So for example, if you defined the outcome as the uh, quality of life measured using the short form 36, the uh, SF36 has eight subscales for uh, general health, mental health, physical, uh, and role functioning. Um, and it results in a component score for mental health, a component score for physical health. So there are a lot of different ways, even for a single measure like the SF36, where you can define the outcome differently. We found that there were lots of different metrics. So uh, there were change from baseline. Uh, others used the value at the end of the trial. There were lots of different methods of aggregation. So some uh, reports described continuous outcomes, some described categorical. And across these 21 trials, we had 214 unique outcomes, 
associated with 1,230 results, but only 300 of those, uh, 305 of those results appeared in public data sources. And we suspect that that's a, uh, an underestimate of the problem because we had non-public data sources for only six out of the 21 trials. We expect that there's a great deal of multiplicity uh, in non-public sources about the trials that were published in journal articles, but for which we did not have access to those non-public data sources. So we think that we're underestimating the scope of, uh, of selective reporting that might be present here. And this is just a flow diagram showing the same thing. You can see that at the top, we have four outcome domains, 21 RCTs, 71 reports. We know that there are 214 unique outcomes, but we also had this problem on the, the left here that's in a kind of grayed out box of these outcomes and results that were not sufficiently defined for us to actually determine what treatment effect has been assessed because we couldn't define the uh, outcome completely based on the information that was in the, the public sources, or we didn't understand enough about the methods of analysis based on the public sources to figure out how the data had been analyzed and whether we were observing the same result that we were seeing in, in other sources about the same trials. And you can see that there's multiplicity here, uh, associated with each of the different aspects uh, described on the previous slide. So in the next stage, we looked at what the consequences of this multiplicity were for systematic reviews. Um, and uh, we were thinking about what the consequences might be for decision makers or guideline developers who are trying to pull together these trials in order to uh, make a choice about recommending or using a, uh, an intervention. So across all of the different data sources at the top of this figure on the left, we created a, uh, a distribution of the meta-analyses that you could conduct just for this pain intensity domain, which was the primary outcome domain. And then we did the same thing for each of the different data sources, journal articles, FDA reports, uh, and individual patient data. And uh, here we uh, show a distribution of 10,000 theoretical uh, theoretical meta-analyses. Uh, and at the bottom, uh, we show the smallest possible effect. So if we cherry-picked the smallest result from each trial, and then the largest possible effect. So if we cherry-picked the largest effect uh, from each trial. And the dashed black line here is the line of no effect. So the smallest effect here uh, overlaps with that line, whereas the largest does not. What we found uh, was that you could do 34 trillion different meta-analyses of this pain intensity domain. So combining results from the same trials, there are 34 trillion different meta-analytic effects that you could find. The smallest possible effect is not statistically significant, whereas the largest uh, possible effect is a large effect and it is statistically significant. Uh, and so what this means is that there's a lot of opportunity, not just for the trialist to select which results they're going to report, but there's a lot of opportunity for meta-analysts meta and guideline developers to cherry pick which results they use in their synthesis. A way around this problem would be to use core outcome sets for clinical trials and uh, systematic reviews. So this idea has been proposed uh, that we select uh, with patients and clinicians and trialists a minimum set of the outcome measures that should be reported in all randomized trials of a given health condition. Um, and that we use that minimum set of measures in, uh, in both trials and systematic reviews. And that uh, a trialist might add additional outcome measures to that, but any trial in that health condition would use some core set that uh, would allow us to compare across trials. It would uh, perhaps reduce research waste by reducing the number of trials that need to be conducted in the same condition. And it, all, it would also get at this problem of multiplicity and, and selective outcome reporting that follows from it. So here's an example of one. This is the uh, core outcome set for pain that uh, comes out of the impact group. And you can see that they've recommended things at the level of domain. They've uh, recommended the trials measure pain, physical functioning, emotional functioning, global improvement, uh, adverse events and, uh, and this participant disposition category at the bottom. Uh, and they've suggested in a few places how those domains might be measured. Pain could be measured on an 11-point scale, for, exa uh, for example, and they've suggested a brief pain inventory for physical functioning. But uh, this core outcome set doesn't define the outcomes in the level of detail that we showed before, which would really be necessary in order to prevent uh, selective outcome reporting bias and to uh, 
uh, ensure that the outcomes across trials are measured and reported in a way that is directly comparable. One way that uh, we talked about at the beginning for preventing selective outcome reporting and publication bias is to register trials in advance. There's been a lot of pressure to do this lately. Um, drug trials have been in the news a lot since 2007 when the Food and Drug Administration Amendments Act was passed, and it required that trials of FDA regulated products be registered uh, and reported on clinicaltrials.gov. Over the last year, uh, the NIH has implemented similar requirements for all NIH-funded research, which includes behavioral intervention research and, uh, and other clinical trials. Um, and a number of organizations have been following whether these trials are actually registered and reported on time. So Stat News has followed this closely, and they found uh, in a second piece published in January of this year that academic institutions were doing a better job than they had been two years before when they looked at this. And we looked at uh, a survey of academic institutions to see whether investigators were actually being supported in these tasks. So we uh, invited 783 organizations to participate in this survey. About 366 actually completed our questionnaire. What we found was that most organizations don't have a trial registration policy. They don't have a results reporting policy. They're not using computer software or other systems to uh, manage their records and to monitor whether studies are actually being uh, reported on time. And they don't have the staff that we think are likely to be necessary in order to uh, ensure that trials are actually uh, registered and, and reported on time. Um, what this means is that they're leaving these tasks up to investigators. We're expecting that investigators understand this clinicaltrials.gov framework for defining their outcomes, that they understand these problems uh, of reporting the results in a way that is consistent with that framework and, and comparable across trials. Um, but what we're finding is that there are also people at a lot of organizations who are called protocol uh, registration system administrators, PRS administrators, um, the people who interact with clinicaltrials.gov and similar systems on a regular basis, who have a, a great deal of expertise about how to meet these requirements and how to ensure that these tasks are done. Um, consistently and, uh, and to high quality. Um, and we think that investigators could use more support from those sorts of people uh, in accomplishing these tasks. So uh, the conclusions that I want to leave you with today, uh, we know that multiple outcomes and multiple analyses in clinical trials, as well as other types of uh, scientific research, lead to a lot of numerical results. And that these sources of multiplicity create huge opportunities for cherry picking within individual trials and also in research synthesis. We think that increased consistency across uh, trials of the same problem or in the same population would help us reduce research waste by ensuring that uh, trial results are comparable and that they are reported completely and consistently in a way that allows us to prevent selective outcome reporting. Uh, we think that plans for conducting clinical trials and other types of research should be registered and reported completely, um, and that institutions, uh, universities, academic medical centers could be doing a better job than they are today of supporting individual investigators and meeting the increased registration and reporting requirements that we have, both for FDA regulated research and increasingly for other types of clinical research that's, uh, that's sponsored by the National Institutes of Health and other funders. So uh, that's all I have today. Uh, I look forward to the questions that you have for me. Uh, if you'd like information about any of the research that uh, I've talked about today, the DOIs are on these slides and you can also find links to these papers on my website uh, where we also link to the data and the code that are used uh, for most of these studies, uh, which has been registered and, uh, and deposited on Dryad and other repositories. I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you um, very much for that presentation. Uh, very interesting and uh, thought-provoking. Um, We've got uh, a number of questions uh, already, and uh, I'm sure we'll get other questions coming in from participants. Uh, I'll just uh, note off the top that uh, you opened this with a general uh, commentary on concerns about reproducibility. Uh, 
And it's concerns about reproducibility that drive a, an awful lot of what our office does related to methods. We, ha we sponsor this Methods Mind the Gap webinar to bring uh, state-of-the-art methods to the attention of uh, our investigator community in, in hopes that they will use them and that that will uh, help improve the situation in terms of rigor and reproducibility. Uh, we have created online courses in, in uh, uh, various methods, again, for the, uh, the same kind of purpose. So we're very interested in that and particularly interested in trying to drive down uh, publication of what amounts to type 1 errors. Uh, so I, I was very sympathetic to that part of the presentation. Um, uh, let me pose a, a, a few questions um, uh, just to start this discussion. Um, now, it, uh, uh, perhaps a naive perspective on multiplicity or multiple outcomes uh, is that uh, we can avoid that problem by having a single primary outcome in a study and by having a single primary analysis plan for that outcome so that the combination of a single outcome and a single analysis plan leads us to a single test of our primary hypothesis. Uh, and if we publish all of that in the protocol and list all of that in clinicaltrials.gov, uh, then it's possible for anyone to check later and make sure that, that that's what we've done. And, and we avoid the situation of publishing lots of outcomes measured at lots of different times, tested with lots of different methods. And I, I just wonder if you have any uh, thoughts on that, what, what may be a sort of simple-minded approach, but, but possibly an effective approach. So I think that, uh, you know, in reality, trials have to be powered some way. So we have to figure out how many people we're going to recruit. And the primary outcome allows us to do that. So I don't think there's any chance that we're going to get away from having a primary outcome. Um, and those should, of course, be registered and, and reported completely. But I think, uh, you know, we know that trials cost a huge amount of money and that we have an opportunity to learn about lots of different outcomes when we do clinical trials. And so there's no um, there's no reason uh, that I think we shouldn't have more than one outcome in clinical trials. And I think that there are a lot of good reasons that we should. Um, it's much more efficient. It reduces waste. It, uh, it reduces the number of patients that are going to need to be included in, in trials over time. Um, there are, I think, a lot of problems with uh, defining things in multiple ways and only reporting a subset of the things that we've measured and, and analyzed. Um, but I think if we're clear about what the goals of the study were up front and how we've done the measurement and analysis, um, I don't think there is a, necessarily a problem with having more than one outcome. Uh, I think the the problem uh, is the the problem of underreporting and and selective outcome reporting rather than multiplicity itself. Uh, thank you. Um, what are your thoughts about combining different uh, outcome measures into composite or summary scores? and then uh, doing the analysis on some sort of composite or summary rather than separate analyses on a bunch of outcomes. It's a, a strategy that's used in a lot of research um, for problems mainly related to power, I think, rather than multiplicity, um, where, or, or, or due to the nature of the outcome where some of the data will be censored for one reason or another. Um, I think, uh, you know, related to this problem of multiple outcome definitions, it it's fine to do that if it's registered in advance and uh, and specified in advance. Composite outcomes, of course, raise a lot of problems where they might be driven by uh, one component of the composite. And so, to understand composite outcomes, it's usually necessary not just to report the composite, but also to report the individual components of the composite. Um, and there are also a lot of issues related to whether the items that go into the composite are of similar importance to patients. So uh, heart attack and, and death are obviously of different levels of importance. So we wouldn't want to uh, ignore the fact that when we have a composite that's related to mortality or a cardiovascular event, that cardiovascular events and, and mortality might be of very different uh, levels of importance. Um, but I think the composite outcome can 
uh, can be a good and, and useful strategy in clinical trials, I would just ensure that in the same way any other outcome is specified in advanced composites should be as well. All right, thank you. Uh, there's a lot of interest in this idea of core outcome sets and a number of questions uh, related to those. Uh, so, for example, is there a website or other source that allows investigators and researchers to look up minimum core outcomes in different areas? Uh, or yes. who determines what the core outcomes ought to be? So the uh, common initiative, uh, the core outcome measures in trials uh, might be what that stands for. Um, you can uh, see the link at the bottom of this slide. Um, Comet does a lot of work uh, about the methodology behind the development of core outcome sets, uh, and they also uh, act as a repository of core outcome sets. So if you search on the Comet database, you will find core outcome sets that uh, have been uh, recorded there, as well as information about core outcome sets that are under development. And the methods that are used to develop them can vary. So uh, there are a lot of people who use stated preference methods to try to understand what patients and um, clinicians think are the most important outcomes in a particular clinical condition. Um, a lot of what's been done uh, and is identified on the comment website uh, has been developed using Delphi panels and other sorts of um, uh, consensus methods where you have perhaps a group of patients in one group who uh, rate a number of different outcomes and then discuss which outcomes are most important to them and a group of uh, clinicians in another group who rate outcomes and identify what's important to them. And then you can bring them together into a group and ask them to compare what they uh, identified as being most important. Uh, OMERET, which is a group in rheumatoid arthritis, uh, did a lot of work around core outcome set development early on uh, and found that there were important differences between what patients and what clinicians thought were the most important uh, outcomes to people with arthritis. And so a lot of the uh, movement here towards core outcome sets has been focused on incorporating patients and making sure the patient views are taken into account. Thank you. Uh, when you're working with these core outcome sets, do you treat the whole set as the primary outcome or do you do you identify something within the set as the primary outcome? You know, you don't want to have uh, 10 primary outcomes if there are uh, uh, 10 items in your outcome set. Right. So in the impact group, for instance, pain is probably going to be the domain that's of greatest interest, and you would probably pick one of the outcomes within that as as your uh, as your primary. Um, but the the idea is less about which you identify as primary, and more about uh, making sure that all of these outcomes are actually measured measured, so that we can compare the results uh, in two different trials of the same condition, and that we capture the information about the outcomes that are most important to patients, so that if you've done a trial of an intervention for pain and you've measured pain and emotional functioning, you've also measured physical functioning so that we don't have to go back and do another trial to get information about physical functioning. Um, it's a question about the role that journals uh, may have to play in uh, ensuring that uh, all primary outcomes are reported. Um, so let's say uh, an investigator uh, registers their primary outcomes on clinicaltrials.gov, um, and then some of those uh, turn out to be positive in terms of an effect, and some of them turn out to be uh, no effect, uh, possibly some of them even negative. Uh, should journals uh, somehow be required to report all of those outcomes that were registered in, in clinicaltrials.gov? Uh, I can't imagine how that would be done, but is there some obligation for the journal to uh, address the collection of primary outcomes rather than say, no, we're only going to publish the, the ones that have a, a, a favorable p-value? Yeah, I think that um, journals are partly addressing this by just having the requirement that trials be registered um, because I think peer reviewers and editors um, kind of naturally ask people to report all of the information about the primary and secondary outcomes. 
um, which is to say, you know, journals want to publish trials that are going to have high impact and draw a lot of attention, um, but they uh, they don't want to publish necessarily unbalanced uh, interpretations of those trials. And I think editors and peer reviewers realize that if you're only selectively reporting the outcomes from within a trial, that that's not a balanced and honest um, uh, interpretation of the results. Uh, NIH has also helped a lot with this problem in requiring that the results of clinical trials be posted on clinicaltrials.gov. So um, I, I think a lot of the discussion in this area has focused on the role of journals, but um, journals have said, you know, repeatedly throughout these discussions over decades now that they're not the, the only stakeholder in this uh, environment. And so NIH stepping in and saying that those results have to be reported a year after the completion of the trial on clinicaltrials.gov means that that information is available somewhere even if the journal doesn't publish all of the primary and secondary outcomes. But I, I think it would be standard practice in most um, kind of leading journals that uh, your table with the results would include the primary and secondary outcomes. Uh, is clinicaltrials.gov doing a good enough job um, if if you had the opportunity to speak to the folks in charge, what advice would you give them in terms of how to improve the way that clinicaltrials.gov uh, is organized or what information it collects or presents so that it could do a, an even better job? So uh, it's a great question, and I think that there are um, kind of two ways of answering that. One is that the main group that is not doing a good job is us. So uh, for trials of FDA regulated products, which are many of which are conducted by drug manufacturers and device manufacturers, the registration and reporting rates today for most major manufacturers are near perfect. Um, major companies have understood what the compliance requirements are and have hired staff and developed systems for ensuring that their trials are in compliance with the new rules. Now, historically, of course, that wasn't true, but um, today most major companies are, are taking these issues seriously and doing a very good job of compliance. Non-compliance is actually occurring at a much higher rate uh, in academia than it is in industry. Um, and so we as investigators, as department chairs, as deans, whatever, um, are not doing a very good job of setting up systems where trials get registered and their results get reported. Um, so that that's the first answer to the question is that I think a lot of the problem is with us and with the systems that we have for, for accomplishing what we're supposed to accomplish on clinicaltrials.gov. There are also ways in which clinicaltrials.gov and NIH, I think, could uh, improve and make this easier for people. So uh, the structure of clinicaltrials.gov, I think, works very well for your standard like two group or placebo controlled drug trial. But if you have a more complex design where you have two stages of randomization, if you have a crossover design where participants receive interventions in sequence, A then B or B then A, um, those sorts of trials are actually very difficult to report on clinicaltrials.gov um, because the, uh, the tables and the uh, reporting requirements are really not set up to uh, deal with them. Now, the folks at clinicaltrials.gov will say that they've never had a problem actually fitting something into their standard format, but it means that the results uh, and the information for uh, different trials appears in different places and in different formats, and what you think should be in a field is not necessarily what's in that field. So for people who do meta-research like me, it's difficult to make sense of them across the board. So I think that we need to have a more adaptive system that is designed for dealing with uh, various uh, types of requirements, uh, different types of trials. I also think it's not a very user-friendly system. So if you're an, an investigator who's coming into it for the first time, uh, you benefit really from talking with the PRS administrator at your institution to figure out how to meet those requirements um, rather than try to deal with it yourself. And then finally, I think the um, requirements that we have for clinicaltrials.gov should line up better with the requirements that we have in other systems. NIH now has uh, trial uh, protocol templates, 
uh, FDA has trial protocol template, the data elements that we have in those templates, the data elements that we require for IRBs, uh, the data elements that we require when we submit manuscripts to journals. I think all of those things should be lined up uh, and better coordinated. And when we require that people submit to NIH a trial protocol that has different information from a trial registration, people might look like they're doing things inconsistently, even if they aren't, just because the information or the structure of the information is different. So I think we need to make it easier on the investigators to, to meet the increasing number of requirements that we have to prevent these sorts of type one errors. Uh, I, I agree with you. And uh, I will uh, note that uh, NIH is uh, working hard to try to align the reporting requirements that are required for new and under the new clinical trials uh, grant submission process, for example, uh, with the requirements in clinicaltrials.gov. I think the, the folks in the Office of Extramural Research are hoping that at some point uh, people can simply uh, uh, click on a button after they've entered their data with the uh, grant submission process and it automatically populates clinicaltrials.gov and they don't have to go through a separate registration process. That's down the road a bit, but that's the I think the the, the long term goal, uh, and I think it will improve things. Uh, um, I agree. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, w one of the one of the tools or weapons, uh, depending on your perspective, that NIH has available um, to prod people into better behavior um, is uh, the. Uh, sometimes not so subtle uh, suggestion that uh, funding might to a particular institution might be limited or curtailed or even uh, projects might be stopped uh, because uh, uh, investigators at that institution are doing something inappropriate or not, or not reporting uh, sufficiently. Uh, that uh, usually happens in the case where there's a big human subjects issue that blows up. Uh, but uh, certainly there is that kind of uh, encouragement uh, or tool that could be used to en encourage better reporting. Um, do you think that might be helpful if there were some kind of requirements for reporting that had an impact on the institution's ability to continue to receive funding? So uh, since the beginning of this year, that is what the NIH policy allows. Uh, clinical trials have to be registered and reported, and if they're not, the policy, in theory at least, allows NIH to withhold uh, future funding. Um, to my knowledge, NIH has never done that, and since 2007, when the Food and Drug Administration Amendments Act uh, authorized FDA to levy penalties for the non-registration or non-reporting of trials, FDA has never penalized anybody for uh, failure to register or report the results of a trial. So those penalties um, could be substantial as well. If you do a trial of a drug or a medical device, uh, the current rate I think is about $11,600 per trial per day for non-compliance with those requirements. Um, and a lot of institutions are at the moment at, at huge financial risk if those penalties were to be imposed. But I, from this survey that we did and from some qualitative research on the back of it, uh, there are a lot of institutions that don't take it seriously because they don't think that FDA or NIH will ever actually impose those penalties. Um, there are, of course, institutions that have taken uh, these requirements seriously because they are worried about that, but also because they're interested in doing good science and appearing to be leaders uh, in the field in that way. Um, but I think unless NIH actually starts imposing those sorts of penalties, uh, the organizations that have so far uh, not been concerned about this aren't going to be concerned about it. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. Uh, sometimes uh, a few examples uh, will go a long way. Uh, so that may be something for us to consider. Uh, we have another question related to the uh, core outcome sets. Are there systematic reviews that use uh, core outcome sets? So that's increasingly something that I think systematic reviewers are thinking about. Um, Paula Williamson from Comet and Mike Clark, who used to be head of the Cochrane Collaboration and still does a lot of work in this area, have been talking about this at, at Cochrane meetings now for a few years. Um, and there's been a push in different disciplines. So I think, for example, uh, in arthritis, where there were already a lot of people working on that in clinical trials, 
uh, many of the systematic reviews are also using those uh, outcome sets. In pain, I know that people are using uh, these outcome sets. Um, and in some of the groups uh, that we have here at Johns Hopkins uh, related to eyes and vision, I know that people have been paying attention to some core outcomes in those areas. Um, so I know within at least the Cochrane Collaboration, which is an organization that does a, a lot of systematic reviews, there's been attention to this. Um, but I, I don't have any data about the extent to which systematic reviews outside of, of Cochrane might be doing that. And I think it might come down to whether the people who are doing those reviews are, are even aware of core outcome sets or aware of core outcome sets in the, uh, the areas that they're working on. Uh, you earlier uh, spoke a little bit about the uh, issue of people changing outcomes uh, over the course of a trial or uh, uh, promoting uh, what started out as secondary outcomes to become primary outcomes and demoting what started out as primary outcomes to be secondary outcomes. Certainly, I have encountered that sort of thing. Uh, are there circumstances where it's appropriate to, to, to make those kinds of changes? And if so, what might they be? So there might be cases where uh, for reasons that you didn't anticipate, there were problems with collecting a certain outcome or the um, halfway through the trial, you realize that the event rates are not going to support the sorts of analyses that need to be conducted. So it, it's not uncommon for uh, a data monitoring committee to look at the interim results of a trial and to think about whether the trial should be continued or discontinued because of futility um, or for other reasons. And if you realize, you know, halfway through a trial that the only way to continue the trial and to make sense of what you have is to change the outcome, it's okay to do that. Uh, the point is that those sorts of changes should be recorded uh, and the reasons for them and the time at which those changes should be recorded. So it's one thing to change the outcome from all cause mortality to cause specific mortality halfway through the trial when the investigators are still blind to treatment group. It is, I think, a different matter to have analyzed the data, um, to have figured out what the results were, and then to have changed the primary outcome. So the reasons for changing the outcome and the time at which the outcome is changed, I think, are, are important things that should be recorded. And if you register a trial on clinicaltrials.gov, um, the initial registration is recorded and then any changes to the registration that happen over time are also date stamped uh, and become part of the permanent record for that trial. So if you change the outcome a year before the results were unblinded or six months before the results um, uh, were unmasked, then the date of those changes will be visible to the public and that can give you a uh, a good way of explaining to people that we really did change this outcome before we had analyzed the data and we knew the results. Uh, thank you, very helpful. Uh, do you think clinicaltrials.gov uh, reporting could be improved to the point of providing uh, what uh, one of our uh, listeners is calling a vetted registered report? Uh, well, I'm not sure exactly what a vetted registered report is. Uh, registered reports are uh, a way of, uh, of defining the methods and the reasons for conducting a clinical trial or another sort of study. And uh, what a lot of journals now are doing is you can submit the background and the methods for a piece of work. The journal will peer review that. And then the uh, journal is committing to publish the results of that study uh, without respect to the results. So they've agreed in advance that it's a study worth doing and they'll publish the results uh, independent of the results. Um, clinicaltrials.gov is a place for registering obviously all clinical trials, but it is not uh, vetted in any way by the National Library of Medicine or, or FDA. Uh, the only vetting that's happening there is to ensure that the required data elements are present. So if you're doing a clinical trial, you need to register the domain, the measure, uh, and the time point for each outcome. Uh, 
in advance. And if that information isn't present, they'll send the record back and say that you need to add that information. But they're not otherwise in a position to say this is a study worth doing. It's their uh, their duty really to register all of the studies that are being conducted, whether or not the people at the National Library of Medicine happen to think it's a good piece of research. There is more information that you can register on clinicaltrials.gov. So in addition to the things that are in the structured fields on their website, you can post a trial protocol and a statistical analysis plan now as attachments. That's a feature that they've introduced um, more recently. And the things that you might expect in a registered report or in a, um, a published trial protocol, you can now add to clinicaltrials.gov. Um, you're required to do that at the end of the study to share the protocol, and that's where you might document all of the amendments, but there's also nothing stopping investigators from submitting those sorts of documents when they're ready, which might be when the trial is registered or after the study has begun recruitment, you might have finalized your statistical analysis plan and you can attach it to the clinicaltrials.gov record at that time. Yeah, all good ideas. Uh, we have a question about whether the heterogeneity of the sample affects how you address multiplicity. Is the heterogeneity of the, and I'm assuming that people are thinking about the heterogeneity of the uh, participants in a study rather than heterogeneity I, across I, trials? I suspect, yeah, I suspect that that's true. One of the challenges in, uh, in reflecting to you questions from our audience is that I don't get to follow up with the person who asked yes. the question and ask them to clarify it. So, um, so the, this, is, this, is, this is a question about heterogeneity of the sample, I presume participants. Does, can that affect how you address multiplicity? So, I mean, I'll, I'll try to answer it as best I can, and if the person wants to add to it, please do. But um, there are a lot of things that you won't know in advance. Like, there might be weird things about a distribution of uh, results that mean the planned analysis isn't going to work. And there is a limit to which I think we can expect investigators and statisticians to pre-specify all of the various possibilities that might occur in a trial and to imagine how they're going to deal with every possible situation that arises of weird distributions, of uh, you know unexpected uh, differences between subgroups, uh, et cetera. And uh, I think that you know what we haven't done yet as a scientific community is to think about how much of this can really be specified uh, in advance? What level of detail uh, is enough to say we've got a sense of what people were trying to do and it will prevent the sort of multiplicity and, and selective outcome reporting that we want to get away from? But also what level of you know burden is acceptable for investigators? So we can't have them write 300 page statistical analysis plans for a trial that's only going to have 20 people in it. That just wouldn't be a, a good way of spending people's time. So we have to allow and accept that there will be some changes to studies after they've begun. Uh, and we don't want to uh, put people in a straitjacket where they can't do that. Um, we just want to make sure that those changes are documented and clear. Uh, and there's also going to be some work that investigators have to do after a study begins that probably can't be anticipated in advance. And we, we need to allow for the fact that that's going to happen and that's part of science. Thank you. Uh, one last question before we close. Uh, can you give examples of um, universities or uh, other academic organizations who have uh, made an effort to change the sort of incentives that uh, encourage good behaviors uh, in, in the form of reporting and so forth. Uh, are you aware of any universities that have taken actions like that? You know, you're at Hopkins. I don't know if, uh, if our friends in Baltimore have done anything along that line or if you're aware of uh, other examples. Yeah, so Hawkins actually is a great example of this, but there are others too. Stanford has done a lot on this. Duke's done a lot on this. Partners uh, has done a lot on this. And then in industry, there are actually great examples of this too. So um, GSK, which got in trouble years ago for um, selective reporting, I think has uh, really led a lot of good work in this area. But what happened here was that the uh, uh, dean of the School of Medicine asked uh, one of his uh, staff members to do an analysis uh, and look at how many trials that we had 
that were likely out of compliance with uh, the Food and Drug Administration Amendments Act of 2007. Uh, and they found that there were a couple hundred. And so what they did was they uh, put in place a system where every uh, submission to the IRB is tagged if it's clinical trial. It's then forwarded to the clinicaltrials.gov office where uh, there are now, I think, three full-time members of staff who help investigators uh, register their trials, and then before their trials come due, they start sending reminders to people to say, within three months and within one month, you're going to need to report the results of this trial on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and they offer to help the investigators do that. So they explain what the requirements are, and if the investigators need help in meeting those requirements, they'll walk them through what the rules are and provide support in doing that. So we've gotten from over 200 trials that were out of compliance uh, to single digits. Most of the ones that are out of compliance are ones where the investigators have moved or, or passed away, and it's going to be very difficult to uh, fix those records. But uh, Pitt, Stanford, Duke, uh, Partners, and, and Harvard, uh, and a lot of other institutions uh, have done really good work uh, in similar ways where somebody in a key leadership position has said, this matters to us institutionally, and they set up the systems and hired the people to get the job done. Great. Uh, thank you very much for a wonderful um, uh, webinar and discussion. Uh, and I'm going to turn things back to Marie Rienzo. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murray. And thank you to everyone who participated in today's webinar. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we will be posting the slides and a recording of today's session on our website next week. You will receive an email with a link to the recording when it's available. Thank you.